Good morning, Solid Ground, and everyone visiting with us today. It is wonderful to have you with us. Good Friday, where we look upon uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross, knowing that uh, he was raised on Sunday and it wasn't a hopeless case. Amen. And uh, so wonderful to have you in church. I pray that God will speak to each and every one of you this morning as we uh, talk about uh, what Jesus has done for us. And uh, so why don't you open your Bibles to John chapter 19, verses 16 to 30, and we'll read that in a moment. Before I do, why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, this is all about you. You are the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Christ, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, and you finished the job, totally. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for sending your one and only Son, for enduring the heartache of a father who, because there was no other way to save humanity whom you loved, you were willing to sacrifice your Son on our behalf. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that for 2,000 years, You've been moving across the earth to apply this message, the good news of Jesus Christ, a Savior who has died for sinners, to people across the world. And as much as human beings in their evil have tried to silence the message, it cannot be stopped. And your church has been birthed and sprouts up and grows all over the world as people come and recognize the truth of what Jesus has done for them. And so this morning, Lord, we come in alignment with the truth of the one true God who created everything. And we believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died for us. Amen. In our lead up to the text that we are going to read this morning, we see that Jesus has been betrayed. He was arrested and put on trial. He was then mocked. Uh, beaten and charged for what the religious leaders deemed to be blasphemy. After being handed over to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, the soldiers ripped into his body with what they call the catanine, which is a devastatingly painful scourging that left one just short of death. After a drawn out back and forth between Pilate and Herod and the people, he was then sentenced to crucifixion at the crowd's demand. A crown of thorns was made together and pressed down upon his head, and he was made to endure an excruciatingly painful road to Golgotha, a place of hopelessness outside of Jerusalem, carrying his cross upon his freshly flogged back as people just stood by and watched. He's had nails driven through his hands and feet. He's sleep-deprived. He's bleeding out, and with every slight movement on the cross, sending violent pain through his body, he hangs naked. By noon or midday, the weight of the whole world's sin is bearing down on him. He's disorientated from the loss of intimacy with his father, who has turned away. And he's literally surrounded by darkness because the sun has stopped shining. And through King David, the Holy Spirit describes the Messiah's pain. In Psalm 22, he says, Psalm 22 verse 15 reads, My strength is dried up like the baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me in the dust of death. And then he gives the care of his earthly mother Mary into the hands of his disciple John. And this is where we jump in and read. John writes after this, verses, sorry, this is John 19, verses 28. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. It was uh, R.T. Kendall who drew my attention to the ancient Greek word uh, used to describe what Jesus cried out on the cross with his final breath. 
It's the word tetelestai, the Greek word to describe the saying, it is finished. Tetelestai shows up in uh, five different ways if we look at how the word was used in society in the time of Jesus. Let me give them to you. The word tetelestai would be used when a servant was given a responsibility by his master and he would be told not to come back until the work is tetelestai finished. The second usage of the word we find in business, it's when you had an outstanding account, like a Woolworths account or a Trueworths account, like my mom used to have. And when the account is finally settled, the certificate of debt would have the word tetelestai written across the parchment so that no one would hold you to any further payments. It meant paid in full. The priests in those days were charged with finding a sacrificial lamb that was faultless and blemish-free. And if they found a perfect and suitable uh, lamb to sacrifice, the priest would consider the lamb tetelestai, complete. Another way that this word was used was in those who were artists. And uh, as the artist was nearing the end of his work, either a painting or a sculpture, he would stand back a bit and look upon it, and if he realized that there was nothing more that could be added, he would say, tetelesta, it is finished. And lastly, under the Roman government, if you were a criminal in the justice system, and you were arrested for your crime, you were put in prison, and on the outside door or gate of your prison was written on a piece of paper, or whatever they used back then, um, all your offenses that you were guilty for. And when you had done your time in prison and your payment was complete, the word tetelestai would be written over your parchment as a sign from the judge who sent you to prison to tell everybody that you've paid in full. And often you would take that piece of paper and if anyone accused you on the street, aren't you that guy that did all those horrible things? You would You would bring out that piece of paper and say, yes, but it's been paid in full. You see, friends, the gospel is the good news of a finished work that we are to receive. In April 2010, there was the largest oil spill in history, I believe. It happened in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, it was caused by an explosion on an oil rig out at sea. The devastation was huge. 87 days of oil spewing out into the ocean, um, estimated at 3.19 million barrels of oil emptied into the ocean, affecting 149,000 square kilometers. 1,770 kilometers of ocean shoreline were polluted. Marshes and estuaries contaminated and scores of marine life killed. There's an amazing analogy in this story Because um, you would get all these animal um, activist groups coming in and trying to clean up these poor animals that were soaked in uh, crude oil. And uh, there's an account or multiple accounts of how they got so desperate because as much as they cleaned the animals up on the outside, what was causing them to continually die was what they had ingested on the inside. And there was nothing you could do about it. It was a helpless situation. You could scrub that penguin down till the cows came home, but it would still die because the problem was deep within. You see, friends, our problem has always been greater than what we can fix. We're pretty good, some of us, at keeping the outside relatively clean. But inside, we're all bankrupt and broken. And so, friends, when Jesus said, Tetelestai, it is finished. What he meant was that my work of dying in your place is done. I have made full amends for your sin. I have taken the punishment on myself that you should have had. I have died in your place. And so for eternal life now to become possible, the pure, spotless life that we can receive from the inside, Jesus took upon us and dealt with fully the worst of us. 
Friends, nothing can be added to the work of Jesus that he accomplished for the salvation of people. Nothing. It is Jesus plus nothing for your and my forgiveness of sins. See, I walked my entire high school and early university life worrying about whether I had done enough to secure God's forgiveness and acceptance over my life. I often pictured my life coming to an end. What if? And then me standing before God and Him being disappointed that I've just not quite measured up and denied entrance to His heaven. And it was the good news of the Bible that finally set me free. Although I had heard the gospel so many times, I grew up in church. I listened to my dad preach the truth of the gospel weekly, yet somehow it was only till late in my life, in my early 20s, that my eyes were opened when a visiting preacher taught on how we are saved by adding nothing to what Jesus has accomplished by us. And I realized that I come empty-handed. There is nothing more that I can or should ever try to do to add to my salvation. I simply come to receive because Christ has accomplished it all. I can't pay for my sins. I can't wash myself clean. I can't give myself a new heart. I can't wash the inside. Christ had to do it all. It has been done on my behalf. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 to 14, the author writes, But this man, speaking of Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool, footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. In John chapter 19, we see this account of them taking a sponge and putting it in sour wine and giving it to Jesus. You know, many scholars believe that the sponge that Jesus was fed was what we call a tesorium in ancient Roman language. That was what was commonly a sponge, and, and sponges weren't used for much other than to wipe the sweat of a hard-working soldier under his helmet or as Roman toilet paper. So they would have a sponge in their public bathrooms, and uh, it would be attached to a stick. It's a gross thing, I do understand, <laughs> on a Friday morning. Um, but the sponge would be, uh, would, 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 be, would be there soaking in sour wine as a disinfectant vinegar and uh, and that's what people used to clean up after themselves and it may or may not be true but some scholars scholars genuinely believe that this was possibly a sign of mockery that a tesorium was used dipped in sour wine and here's the thing it was it was put on the end of a hyssop branch and if that jogs your memory, it's good because it's all over the Old Testament. A hyssop branch is what God instructed the Israelites to use to paint the blood of the spotless lamb on the lintels of their doorpost. And there's this image in my mind of a Roman soldier giving the worst of humanity to the mouth of Jesus while he holds on to the sweet-smelling, fragrant scents of a hyssop branch, which was given to us. And we, Jesus got the worst of our life. We were giving the fragrance and his blood painted on our lives. I remember the preacher who preached the gospel in which my eyes were opened to the finished work of Christ saying that if God sent Jesus to the cross to endure all of that when it comes to our forgiveness of sins, why on earth would he then leave any remaining necessary work in our faulty hands? Why would he go through all that? To say, oh, you've still got to add another 10%. When our history of human failure tells us we'd never be able to achieve anything. Friends, every other world religion is you've got to do to achieve, to find your way back. Jesus didn't die on a ladder, friends. He died on a cross. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're scared of meeting God because of who you are. And in fact, you've actually avoided God and His church for a long time because the guilt of your life haunts you. 
You try to make it better. You try to string together a couple of good weeks so that you can feel at the end of those, that we have had a good run. I think God is happy with me now. Friends, that's not the gospel. That's not good news. I'm here to tell you this morning, you can trust in his finished work. So come right now as you are. God wants to receive you where you are at. Forgive you. He has worked completely to make this possible. And maybe you're a Christian here this morning who's struggling with deep anxiety around your life. And you still see kind of your Christianity as a set of works that you need to implement and get right. And this morning, God wants to remind you of his grace. This all started in grace. It continues in his grace and it ends in his grace. And I invite you to enter into the rest of the finished work that Jesus has done. We're going to play a song now and afterwards we're going to take communion together. Um, It's the same guy that wrote a a very well-known song a while ago called um, uh, I Surrender. I don't know if some of you know it. His name is Maddie Crocker, but they released a song last night about Jesus' work on the cross. And I'd like us just to sit quietly and let the lyrics speak to us this morning, and then we'll take communion together. But let me ask you this. Will you do business with God this morning, no matter where you're at? Will you enter into his rest this morning and say, Jesus, I remind myself again, it is finished. I am forgiven. All those who believe in the Son of Man who are lifted up are given eternal life. He did the work. I receive the gift. Will you do that this morning? Let's listen together.